Patrick. Hi, Dan. How's it going? It's going well. It's been a while since we've actually recorded a podcast. Yes, it has. I think we've both been uh, busy doing a whole variety of things involving what in the heck is our university or our respective universities going to do in the fall and how do we adapt to it? Yeah, if we're not careful, we could spend all of the time that we allotted for this talking about the cluster expletive that is planning for the fall in the age of runaway uh, COVID-19. Yeah, it is... Uh... A not, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to try to do to chart a course at this point, given that there's really no national guidance that makes any sense. And you've got students coming from all parts of the world and everybody's got financial issues. It's, it's, a, it's a mess. I'm just very glad that I'm no longer in high level academic administration. So I don't have to be making any of these decisions and dealing with the fallout from them. You just have to deal with the fallout from them. Well, not so much the fallout as someone complaining to me about a bad decision that I made as, okay, saying to the faculty, now that we're going to be doing this kind of blended hybrid instruction, how can we make the best of this? What kind of things can we do? So I'm actually doing a bunch of that right now, talking to faculty about how you translate stuff into an online format and those sorts of things. So, Yeah, I'm actually somewhat excited for making an online course. I'm not so excited about the idea of a hybrid course, but I don't think I will be teaching a hybrid course because one of the courses I'm teaching has a large 100 plus enrollment and we don't have space to allow for social distancing and that kind of enrollment, ergo, uh, it's gonna be online only. The other course I'm teaching is an advanced seminar for undergraduates, the science fiction seminar, but those students may not be on campus because they're juniors and seniors. So unless they are students who have special needs to be on campus, like you know their home situation is terrible, or they're taking certain categories of classes for which like they need to be there, potentially labs, they're not going to be invited back. So I may be entirely online next semester. <laughs> Yeah, my, my honors seminar in the fall is a sophomore level seminar, and most of those students are probably going to be on campus, but some of them are maybe not going to be, and I'm not going to be on campus. Um, there are reasons why it's risky for me to do that involving family and things like that. So I'm going to be teaching completely online, and I'm perfectly fine with that because it's a small seminar. We'll do breakout groups and that kind of thing, and Zoom is pretty good at these things, so... Yeah, this is all assuming that there is a on campus in the fall, which I think is looking less and less likely. I'm going to refrain from any sort of speculation on that at the moment. We're just going to plan according to what the university has told us, and we'll see what happens. All right, so today we are going to be talking about uh, international regimes, transactions, and change. Embedded Liberalism in the Postwar Economic Order. This is a 1982 piece by John uh, Gerald Ruggie, who was actually at Columbia when we were there, or briefly overlapped. You have some stories to tell about that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, this was published uh, in, did I already say where it was published? You didn't say where, you said where. Oh, right, so this was published in International Organization, uh, volume 36, issue two. It was in a special issue on international regimes that was edited by Stephen Krasner, and even when we got to Columbia in 1995, you got there in 1994, this was a, still a big thing that people were reading and talking about. Absolutely. So now, not so much, although as I think we'll discuss, there's a lot of wheel reinvention going on here. Yes. I mean, I mean Susan Strange and her contribution, which we've decided we're gonna talk about next week, uh -huh. um, she says that this is wheel reinvention in the early 80s. I read this and I'm like, oh my God, this is all stuff that we were talking about in the 90s and early 2000s. And then it's stuff that we're talking about today, uh, first in the context of uh, constructivism and then in the context of, of hegemony. And that maybe uh, gives away some of the game in terms of some of the significance of, of both that collection, but this piece in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about John Ruggie? You are positioned to do so. Sure. So John, uh, John Ruggie uh, is currently at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's been there since 2001 as an affiliate. He was before that at Columbia. He had been the dean of SEPA, the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, he also had taught at Berkeley and uh, UCSD and sort of went bi-coastally back and forth for a little while. Um, he is one of the main reasons I went to Columbia to do my PhD. 
I had read this piece and also the piece that he and Fritz Craddockwill wrote in the 1986 special issue of International Organization, uh, The State of an Art on an Art of the State. Um, so I'd read that and, and was very excited by the kind of stuff that, that John was, was doing. And so I went to Columbia basically to try to work with him. And I was able to connect with him uh, during the brief time that he, between being Dean of SEPA and when Kofi Annan appointed him an Assistant Secretary General, uh, then he went and was mostly working at the UN at that point. But he was on campus and around for about a year. And during that time, he was my chair. He was my original dissertation chair and we had several sessions kind of talking about the general outlines of, of what I was going to be working on and he was able to give me feedback on early drafts of things but then because of his obligations at the UN he was unable to continue as my chair which is how Ira Katz Nelson ended up becoming my chair. Um, so John's quite important with uh, the story of sort of how I got to Columbia in the first place. The thing that strikes me in reading this piece is how much of this is constructivism without the name constructivism before the name constructivism was around. John has always occupied a very strange place in the sort of IR pantheon because I think one would, would probably classify him as a constructivist, but he was clearly doing what he was doing a long time before the term showed up. Um, and so there, there's a there's an interesting kind of generational issue here about when people had these particular kinds of insights and, and what they what they ended up doing with them. But John has been at the Kennedy School uh, since 2001. He continues to work in the doing various kinds of things in international organization practically. He is according to his bio, which is interesting because I didn't actually know this, um, but he's the chair of something called the, non, uh, the, the board of directors for the nonprofit SHIFT, which advises governments, companies, and civil society on business and human rights issues. So I know that's one of the things that he has been very involved with. When he was at the UN, he was one of the people who helped to create that, that uh, compact on human rights and, and business practices. So that was one of the things that he got really involved when he was there. So he's still very active. He's, his publications have shifted mostly away from academic journals. So he still writes an awful lot, but it, it doesn't show up in sort of uh, scholarly circles in quite the same way. So, but a fascinating guy who, uh, who I count as one of the people who was sort of important in my early intellectual formation, so. Oh, cool. I mean, I remember uh, the, your sort of, the year that you came out on the job market being at APSA, I think, mm -hmm. or I say in Washington, D.C., and John, even though he was no longer your chair, certainly went out of his way to name check your work and you know, yep. did the kinds of things you would expect an advisor to do. And that was, I think, really good of him. Oh, yeah. And when I was actually out applying um, and I was uh, sending letters and such, John did, you know, the most important thing that an advisor, even by that point, he was a former advisor, but the most important thing an advisor could do, which is he not only wrote letters, but he picked up the phone. So he called some people, which was really helpful. Um, that's the kind of thing that's the thing that makes the difference in, in this thing we loosely call an academic job market, right? Having sets of recommendations from, from people who you trust. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to John for that too. So uh, we should discuss, or you should discuss the whiskey pick for today. And uh, while yes. you do that, I'm going to get a glass of water because if you can't tell, I'm suffering from really severe dry mouth. Mm. So okay. you so introduce the whiskey, I'll, I'll be back by the, the time you are done that, introducing the whiskey. That sounds, that sounds good. That sounds good. So what have I chosen for today? What I have chosen for today is, and I'll see if you can see that on the screen there. This is uh, a whiskey that is produced by one of my favorite small Scottish uh, Isla distilleries. This is Kilholman. And Kilhoman is a small farm distillery. The, their annual production is approximately a day's worth of production or maybe a week's worth of production for a big distillery like Glenfiddich or something. So Kilhoman is a very small operation. They have these distinctive bottles right, that you can always tell a Kilhoman bottle because it's shaped a little bit differently. Um, and the version that I've chosen for today, they produce a stuff called 100% Isla which is uses Isla barley and is malted right there and uh, then distilled and finished right there uh, all in one place. Um, why do I choose this? Partially I choose this because 100% Isla is really good stuff and I'm very happy to have an, 
excuse to drink it. Um, but part of it is because something that struck me in reading this piece, again this time, is the way that embedded liberalism as an international arrangement makes possible a kind of nationalist focus for the economy, for the society it allows an insulation from international economic shocks. So the kind of irony of an international arrangement that makes possible something that then can turn around and kind of present itself as being completely authentically domestic uh, struck me as, as quite interesting. And the idea of 100% Isla that is you know, produced 100% on Isla, except the barrels that they use, which are imported, and not all the grain is entirely grown there, and the market is international, and if it weren't for the international market, this wouldn't exist in the first place. So the kind of irony of that struck me as quite appropriate. So it is, in that sense, embedded liberal whiskey. I can pretend I'm drinking that rather than a fairly pedestrian Dalwini 15. Dalwini's but... good too. Cheers. So as you've already alluded to, this is an important work uh, in terms of being an early example of what would become constructivism. And one thing that struck me reading this was the degree that, excuse me, one thing that struck me reading this was the degree that it's using the same language that will appear in constructivist theory later. Mm -hmm. So lots of discussion about intersubjectivity, social purpose, and so on and so forth. So it's important in that regard as a precursor of capital C constructivist thought. It's also important, of course, uh, in terms of our understanding of hegemony and hegemonic orders. And then it's also important in terms of our understanding of post-war liberal order. So those are kind of the three big things that I think I see as topics of conversation. Mm -hmm. I did mention that this is part of a uh, edited volume or a special issue is both. Uh, we, I think I have the edited volume somewhere in my office, which was about this idea of international regimes. Uh, and this was a notion that uh, we could think about international politics, not simply as anarchical, but we could think about it as having various kinds of governance arrangements, norms, rules. Uh, he has some definitions here uh, mm -hmm. that might uh, structure how states behaved in various issue areas. But people interpreted what it meant to talk about regimes very differently in this volume. There's some story, I don't know if it's true, that Krasner regretted having this more kind of soft sociological conception of regime uh, being the consensus definition. But nonetheless, this is the kind of context of that piece. So it's, it's arguing about regime theory and it's arguing about regime theory in what I, as I've suggested, a more constructivist sense. Mm -hmm. And John is actually, John Ruggie is actually one of the very first people in IR to use the notion of an international regime, not in this piece, but in an earlier piece that he had written, I think back in the late 1970s. Um, it is a term, as I subsequently learned, that has great currency in international law circles. So international regime was novel for a field that was predicated on more or less rationalist interactions between independent sovereign states. But when you talk in international law terms, the idea of a legal regime in a particular functional area was a fairly standard thing. In, in thinking about international law. So Ruggie's twist on this is to really accentuate that intersubjective component to it. So picking up on what you just said about this being kind of constructivism before the, the word constructivism, what strikes me is it is in a, it's constructivist in a lot of ways, except it really doesn't talk about identity, which then becomes such a huge thing for a lot of later constructivist work. You've got intersubjectivity, social purpose, and the contingency of social arrangements i.e. them not being natural necessity. So you've got all that here, but you don't at this point have that language of identity quite as much. You do in some of Ruggie's later work, but at this point, that's not the place that he chooses to pitch his tent. Uh, it is amazing to me, uh, to sort of the reminder of exactly how Weberian Ruggie's work is. I'm reading it going, oh, gee, I, maybe, I, maybe I picked this up from somewhere, huh? Maybe I, maybe I did learn something from my advisor. So how would you, I mean, I, I have some ideas about how I would summarize the argument. How would you do it? So 
my summary of this piece would, or the argument here would be something like this. In the 19th century economic system based on the gold standard, domestic regulation of the economy was curtailed by the need to maintain balance of payments internationally. And because of the relative inflexibility of the gold standard, it meant that governments couldn't do things like pursue full employment policies. And they couldn't do things like create redistributive policies internally because that would cause all kinds of ripple effects that would be problematic on the international markets. So the idea of embedded liberalism, this compromise that Ruggie talks about, is something that is invented to create insulation between domestic economic policy and international economic markets and international economic impact. It allowed governments a certain kind of breathing space. So instead of having to cut down on large numbers of say social welfare policies that would end up uh, producing balance of payments issues because they would raise prices, you could say you create a little bit of a, of a, a buffer there so that the government's actually able to pursue different kinds of policies in relative autonomy. Under the 19th century system, that's not possible because the only thing governments can do is make adjustments based on inflows and outflows of gold. I think Ruggie's great innovation here I mean, usually what gets cited as the great innovation here is the innovation of embedded liberalism itself. And I think that is entirely innovative as a way of describing post-war institutions and the post-war arrangement. But I actually think that the real sort of theoretical innovation here, like with Karl Polanyi on whom he leans for a bunch of this argument, is the identification of a social purpose even in the 19th century gold standard. So the idea is not, we didn't have, we had an economy that didn't have a social purpose and then we got social purpose. It's we had one social purpose and then we replaced it with another social purpose. So the idea in that sense that it's kind of purposes all the way down to use a more constructivist formulation of this. Once we accept that the 19th century gold standard isn't natural, but is itself a product of a certain kind of social consensus about what the function of economic policy should be, it opens up the real possibility of changing it and going in a different direction, which is what I think Ruggie's argument is. That's what happens in the post-war period. Um, and then there's a third part of the argument, which is what's going to happen next. And I think we'll get to that because I, I think there may be parts of this, at least in my opinion, there are parts of this piece that don't hold up quite as well. And I think the end is a part that I'm a little more skeptical of, but I think the beginning parts of the argument, um, which are the 19th century part and then the embedded liberalism part, I think those, those tend to hold up a little bit better. In fact, that's one reason why I think we decided to read, to talk about Susan Strange's uh, response yeah. to the volume next time, because some of the things that she says in criticism of people like Ruggie, I think are borne out. Mm -hmm. So she gets it right in many respects more than he does, at least in terms of what's coming down the pike. It, it, certainly in terms of the future aspects of this and in terms of the, the idea of the stability of the embedded liberal order, I think, I think Strange makes some really good points when it comes to that. Theoretically, I think there's some really interesting things here from mm -hmm. Ruggie. And one of the things she gets right, and I think this is the, the, some of the aspects that I want to make sure we get on the table before we go forward, is that is, is Strange argues that the sense that motivates this entire volume, actually, to a large degree, but also mm -hmm. we see very much in this particular essay, the sense that the United States is no longer a hegemon and that we're moving into what we would now kind of, kind of multipolar world right. in which the Soviet Union is here to stay, in which there are other advanced industrialized democracies that are no longer under the thumb of the United States. Uh, and that, that we then have to figure out how there's cooperation in Bob Cohen's sense after anarchy. Uh, I'm sorry, not after. <laughs> We have to figure out in Bob Cohen's sense after hegemony uh, that she says that's wrong, that the U.S. has a lot of structural power and is going to remain a hegemon, and particularly it has monetary power. And that to me is interesting because this is the debate that I have with uh, Will Weinkoff and a bunch of other people all the time in political economy. When, I, when Alex and I say that hegemony is eroding, right, or that hegemony, hegemony is unraveling, uh, they always point to U.S. monetary hegemony and dollar hegemony and argue that that's the most important power resource. Uh, and that means the United States is going to stay much more powerful than Alex Cooley and I claim. And this is really the same debate that we're having 
back in the early 80s, uh, or at least that Strange sets up uh, in terms of monetary uh, hegemony uh, and structural power versus these more superficial um, things that look like that people are invoking to talk about uh, the U.S. is in decline. So on the hegemony side, the big important part of the story has a lot to do with the social purpose argument. So if you think about conventional hegemonic order, con conventional hegemonic stability theory, and we're talking about very conventional, uh, the argument was that you needed a hegemonic power in order to have open trade. And the reason you needed a hegemonic power in order to have open trade was that in the absence of somebody to use carrots and sticks to force open markets, states would be too worried about relative gains uh, and too worried about uh, other kinds of national interests, but primarily relative gains that might come from specialization that they might be disadvantaged by uh, in, to pursue open trade. So you get an equilibrium, which is protectionist and mercantilist. Uh, as states looked out for their security first and therefore uh, saw open trade and interdependence as a threat. Uh, and so uh, you needed a dominant power, a hegemon, in order to get a stable open trade system. And this role had been played by Britain in the 19th century. Uh, in the Kindleberger story, Britain tries to play it in the interwar period, but it can't play it because it's not powerful enough. So the economy is not stabilized. The United States is actually with the capacity to play global economic hegemon. Uh, and then the United States after uh, World War II then becomes the new hegemon, bringing about open trade. So it's a very deterministic argument. You need a hegemonic power, and if you have a hegemonic power, it will create an open trade regime. And that's how we explain free trade. This is also, if you know, a very realist argument, because it sort of says, in essence, to get some of the things that you get in domestic politics, you need a preponderant power who can act kind of like a poor man's world government. And I think I've talked about this before on earlier podcasts. So one of his big interventions here is to say that it's there is no deterministic link between hegemony and open trade. And indeed, this is something that a lot of people who are working on hegemony in the 70s and 80s are finding. They're finding that the story doesn't kind of work out statistically, or it doesn't necessarily work out when you start getting into kind of micro level or meso level analysis. Uh, it sort of falls apart. And then there are bigger questions like, is trade even a public good? You know, does the theory kind of hold up? And Ruggie's argument here is to say that it actually depends a lot on what the social purpose of the hegemon is. What we might later call identity, what we could call here kind of ideology, uh, its domestic political arrangements, and the way those translate into a worldview in the kind of hegemony it's gonna perform. So Britain in the 19th century is gonna perform a different kind of hegemony, uh, not just for structural reasons and not just because of a common purpose that he argues develops among all European states about what open trade should look like, but also because it just, because of just differences between uh, late 19th century Britain and New Deal United States. So uh, you know, the sort of standard way we would tell the story in a very kind of basic sense is the United States exports the New Deal uh, in terms of how it does hegemony. Uh, and uh, this is for a variety of different reasons, but it builds then this embedded liberal order, which is distinctive from uh, the late quote unquote laissez-faire order of um, the gold standard or the gold standard as practiced in the 19th century, because we still have dollar convertibility into gold until the late 1960s, and then we formally go off it in the early 70s. The, the other argument he makes there in passing, which I think is really interesting, is to point out that we know that hegemons don't automatically equal an open trade regime, uh, because we can run a counterfactual and ask ourselves, what if Germany had been victorious in the Second World War? And we know what German economic arrangements look like, because we saw what Germany did in its, uh, among its puppets in controlled areas uh, in Eastern and East Central Europe. And there it practiced a form of uh, exploitative mercantilism, more or less of ex resource extraction into the core. Uh, and that, you know, very traditional kind of imperial, extractive imperialism. Mm -hmm. and he says, you know, if we Nazi Germany had won and become the new hegemon, we would not expect it to have done liberal order at all or liberal economic order at all. So. That's a really big and important intervention to, to start to associate the character of hegemony uh, or the nature of the order that the hegemon produces with the character of the hegemon itself. Now, it's not completely novel. Um, and he does draw on a number of existing arguments about, for example, how Dutch hegemony is going to look different than, than British hegemony. But nonetheless, this association of it with the social purpose of the hegemon, 
and then more broadly, the inner subjective social purpose that stabilizes around the construction of that order uh, is, I think, quite distinctive from a lot of the variants that come beforehand, even if it isn't we now remember him as being the originator of that argument. Mm-hmm. And even just to expand on that a little bit, even the argument about the arrangements that the Nazis would have likely extended is, of course, indebted to Albert Hirschman's marvelous account of this in National Power and the Structure of Foreign Trade. And what Ruggie is able to do, though, is he's able to bring these disparate pieces of things together and make an argument that is an incredibly cogent reflection at this moment of perceived American decline. And parenthetically, I have to wonder when the United States wasn't worried about its own decline, because it seems like everybody is always worried about decline. It's like Western civilization. It only shows up on the scene when people are worried about it falling apart. Um, So there is something kind of weird about that. But, um, oh, wait, there was a whole article about that, actually. There was that whole piece on, uh, on, on, hegemonic, the, the self-sacrificing hegemon. Uh, was oh, this the, is Isabel uh, Grunberg. Yeah, the, the Grunberg the piece. Myth, the myth of hegemonic. Myth of, yep. Yeah, because she argues that essentially the whole story about hegemony is a uh, is tragedy yep. worked out in, in, in social scientific form. Yes. And that it gets its plausibility from the fact that we're kind of all accustomed to tragedy, uh, but it doesn't make sense. You know, she, basic kinds of arguments like if hegemons are supposed to be able to be foresighted enough to be able to sacrifice in the short term for broad, or, you know, engage in enlightened self-interest, then why would they be dumb enough to set in motion outcomes that would ultimately lead to the erosion right. of their own position? Right. And I think I remember uh, being in uh, Robert Jervis's seminar at Columbia and having him, we read this piece and he said, well, you know, thing about hegemonic stability theory was that it, it seemed really cool and nice, but it doesn't really work. Uh, and then, of course, within five or six years, we're back to talking about hegemony and unipolarity and the stability of the unipolar world. So it's that kind of cycle. And there is a lot of that, the current moment in this piece in a different setting. Um, right. And that's the other, of course, important backdrop of this, which is that this is after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, uh, and the, which is the, you know, it, particularly when Nixon goes off of the gold standard, uh, and uh, you have in the early 80s, right, he's writing this after stagflation and the inflation, and, you know, in, in the midst of actually the, the Reagan recession, right, mm-hmm. where Volcker is trying to combat inflation by essentially um, causing a recession. And his, and so he's writing in this moment in which uh, everybody thinks the United States is in decline. And part of his argument then, as you've alluded to, is that just because the United States may not be a hegemon anymore, as long as the social purpose in the regime is widely shared in international politics, the order that it created will be more or less remain. And then secondarily, and we'll get to this, that the embedded liberalism is a constant, right? That the order hasn't really changed that much, right. even though superficially it looks like it's changed a lot. And both of those points, which I agree are central to the way Bruggy uh, conducts his argument here, depend on an issue that Ruggy sort of circles around and doesn't really zero in on, which is how do you figure out what the social purpose of a given set of arrangements actually is? Now, I give him great praise for pointing out that you can't identify a social purpose any way other than intersubjectively that social purposes are not natural facts in the world, that you have to have some interpretive way of engaging with them in order to figure out what the social purpose is. But the whole argument about, certainly the argument about the social purpose remaining constant, even though the instruments change, but even the argument about a particular set of arrangements instantiating or embodying a particular social purpose depend on us being able to identify what that social purpose is. And I think Ruggy postpones this issue, shall we say, uh, perhaps, um, if we want to be generous about it. He doesn't really tell you how you extract a social purpose from a set of arrangements or from a set of debates about arrangements. And this, I think, raises some really interesting methodological questions that are not really central to the argument Ruggie's trying to make right here. Like, he doesn't tackle those questions. But I think there's an assumption here, both that we know what the social purpose of Bretton Woods is. There's a moment in the text, actually, uh, where, where this sort of specifically struck me. There's a moment in... Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Well, I mean, I'm looking. looking for I mean, yeah, sort of thinking about sort of uh, hitting some some notes on the in the article. He is, as you say, right off the bat, very clear that uh, 
there are epistemological and ontological differences among theories and theorists uh, that, uh, and this is an issue in the social sciences. Um, so he's definitely not a kind of like it's positivism all the way down. We all see the same thing. He has that weird kind of analogy about, you know, that there's a black cat in there, right? This is how he opens, right? Social scientists are looking for this black cat uh, and they get scratches and they have to say there's a, you know, what is it? Uh, the social scientist suspecting from the beginning that there is a black cat in there somewhere and emerging from the room with scratches on the forearm as vindication. Uh, this article consists of another set of scratches together with what I hope will be persuasive reasoning and demonstration that a black cat put them there. Right. And this is, but this is the problem you raised, yeah. right? Which he, he's saying, you know, in essence, I can't conclusively demonstrate to you that this is the social purpose of the post-war uh, economic regime, but I, I think if I sort of have enough uh, observable implications, right, or inferential evidence, I can then, uh, we would, uh, well, it was realists, would, scientific realists would call this what, it's um, abduction. abduction. Yeah, it's that abduction. is a form, right, although that's actually not what abduction, mean, <laughs> abduction yeah. means, but, no, but it's the way, it's that the way it's, it's used. Right, mm -hmm. um, that sort of uh, trying to infer the best explanation from the evidence that's there, uh, and often this is in the context of unobservables for example, mm -hmm. so right. it's heavily. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there were two things that I was thinking of. So right on the point that you're making there about the sort of inference to the best explanation kind of strategy, um, page 402, when Ruggie is talking about the sort of offering an argument that the that, uh, arrangements, concrete international arrangements adhere to one set of social purposes rather than another. So he says, the close similarity between our hypothesized expectations of laissez-faire liberalism and embedded liberalism and actual patterns of transaction flows suggest that regimes do play a mediating role, which I found absolutely fascinating for two reasons. First, because it is this indirect argumentation strategy. It's not, I can see this thing called a social purpose and measure it, and therefore I know what is at work in this particular situation. But also, seeing that a particular set of arrangements corresponds more to one, he says, hypothesis, I'm going to say ideal type, uh, one ideal typical version of what arrangements would look like versus another ideal type. So he's got these two things set up, laissez-faire liberalism, embedded liberalism. He's got the actual observations, which he argues are more in the embedded liberalism camp than they are in the laissez-faire camp. But then he goes from there, not just to say, and therefore we know that these arrangements are embedded liberal. He makes a causal conclusion. Therefore, we know that regimes play a mediating role which I think is, is like a double leap here. That's kind of fascinating. Um, but the other section that I was thinking of uh, with respect to this particular point is a few pages earlier when he's talking about White and Keynes at the Bretton Woods Conference. Um, and at one earlier stage in my life, I spent inordinate amounts of time actually reading a, the transcripts of the Bretton Woods Conference and sort of what went on with these different kinds of debates. Um, and uh, so he talked- Woods conference, by the way. Of, yes, it is. <laughs> Look, there we are. Um, look at all the white men in suits. Um, so we have on 394, 395, Ruggie making the point that you can talk about there being a real similarity of social purpose between white and Keynes, despite, this is quote, considerable differences on instrumentalities. So you could read it that way, but you could also read it as white and Keynes had completely different understandings of what was supposed to happen here. I mean, Keynes comes into this conference really believing that the only way to resolve these balance of payments problems is to create a fully autonomous international currency that would not be under the control of any national government. And if you didn't have that, everything was gonna fall back into some kind of, of problem that you got during the interwar period. You'd have these crises all over again. The only way to do it was to create something that would be an entirely different, totally autonomous currency. White who's an employee of the US Treasury Department, is coming in, trying in many ways to say, let's lock in the power that the United States has and make sure that there's a privileged role for the United States in the system. Now, in part, that's because that's his job brief, but in part, it's also because he earnestly believes that you can't actually have an international economic system unless you've got a national anchor and a powerful national anchor. So you could read those as being technical differences with the same social purpose, but you could just as easily, I think, read those as two very, very different social purposes. And because 
Ruggy doesn't really give us a definition of what a social purpose is, not an operational definition that you could go out and actually collect evidence for, or a procedure for how you determine what a social purpose is. Arguably, either one of those readings is defensible and plausible, but they have really different implications for the argument. Because if you really think that White and Keynes had different social purposes, then what comes out of Bretton Woods is not a social purpose called embedded liberalism, but some kind of compromise between these two different versions. And if you regard Bretton Woods as a compromise, later things that happen might not be a continuation of the Bretton Woods social purpose. They might simply be the flowering up again of the sorts of tensions that were papered over in the beginning that then manifest themselves a little bit later on. So there's a lot at stake here in this issue of how you determine what a social purpose is. And even if we buy Ruggie's general point that you can't talk about an order simply as emanating from material capabilities, you have to talk about social purpose, that doesn't resolve the potential ambiguity in what social purpose actually is at a given point in time. So there are some follow-ons from the argument here that he doesn't really unpack in this piece. I think that's right. Um, I think what we should probably do is turn briefly to his use of Polanyi, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's uh, fairly, you know, as you say, it's an important move, importing uh, Karl Polanyi's account of the Great Transformation into international relations theory. Uh, what do you want to? Do you have anything in particular that you want to say about that? I mean, should we explain Polanyi at all? He's pretty. Yeah, does a pretty good job of explaining Polanyi here. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, although, there's although, a great. Although, although there there is some always some ambiguity about because Polanyi's famous book is called The Great Transformation, and one of the big issues among Polanyi scholars or people who read the book is exactly which of the major social transformations that Polanyi talks about is the Great Transformation, because there's about three of them in the book, um, and so it's a it sort of depends like where you draw the line about which transformation you think is the important one. Um, clearly, Ruggie is of the opinion that Polanyi's great transformation is about the re-embedding of the economy in some notion of social responsibility, that that is the great transformation. And in that sense, embedded liberalism is the great transformation on an international scale. So other Polanyiites might read it a little bit differently. They might say that the, the great transformation is the original disembedding of the economy with the collapse of the commons and the triumph of market logic over the notion of a common sphere that everybody held together. Um, but I don't know that we have to get into Polanyi hermeneutics necessarily. The important point is that Ruggie has, is a particular kind of Polanyiite. He uses Polanyi in a very particular kind of way, which is supported by lots of people who read Polanyi. But I agree on that level that what he summarizes is a perfectly good reading of Polanyi that lots of people adhere to. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for listeners, the key point here is the argument that the disembedding of the economy produces massive social dislocation. Uh, and that's, and it, moreover, more broadly, it, because it shows up here in interesting ways, right? So there are real issues with Polanyi's economic history. Mm -hmm. I think Ira, went, Ira Katz Nelson once said, you know, it's one of those arguments that gets the history completely wrong, but it's probably still right, um, which is uh, I, an interesting kind of way of talking about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's sort of the key argument, right, is that uh, the self-regulating market, what we call laissez-faire, is a utopian concept, and it can't be sustained. Uh, and so, uh, and that's important because Polanyi is going to argue that um, there's a tendency within people who support the self-regulating market to look at market failures and say that's just because we didn't have a truly self-regulating market. We didn't have true laissez-faire. The government intervened here or intervened there and that screwed everything up. Uh, and his point is that you, since you can never have a real self-regulating market, you will always have examples of deviation. And then those examples of deviation can always be used to then justify the pursuit of a self-regulating market. If you've ever argued with a right libertarian, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so that, but, but more fundamentally is this argument that it produces self, social dislocation. It produces intense poverty and miseration. It produces um, uh, population movements um, as people, uh, as labor mobility kicks in and people are looking for jobs, which also socially dislocates them. This is something that all of the major sociologists of modernity all point out, you know, whether it's Durkheim's anime, is the breakdown of organic ties, the reconstitution of people in city life, all of this has uh, enormous, you know, this, this is uh, a massive shift for everybody. 
right? Um, and that social dislocation, uh, Polanyi argues, um, is at the root of a bunch of things, including uh, closely tied to the outbreak of the First World War, but then in particular, uh, in the interwar period, the rise of two alternative ideologies uh, to, the, to liberalism, one of which is, um, is, Marx, is Bolshevism, as he calls it, which is Soviet-style Marxism, uh, and the other is fascism. Right. And so for Polanyi, these are really dangerous because while he's not a liberal, he's a social democrat, both of these approaches throw out what's really important about liberalism, which is what normally we, normally we call political liberalism. Right. So they, they impose authoritarian role um, and they're overreactions. They're quite destructive in the same way that he argues that social democrats sort of go too far uh, and screw some things up themselves and help to produce um, uh, this, this crisis in the interwar period. And then FDR's New Dealism is a solution to that. And if you remember, Polanyi spends a lot of time probably misinterpreting what's happening in the New Deal, but talking about, I mean, he's writing in the, in the 40s, mm -hmm. and talking about how awesome it is because it's experimental and it, it gets you kind of back, this, it gets you, it's experimental, it gets you embedding back. Um, but it, you know, it's sort of, say, well, it's, it's the position that, that certain, like New Deal liberals would take, which is that, you know, they would say New, New, New Deal liberalism saves capitalism from itself. Polanyi is not a capitalist, but in a sense, that's kind of his argument about liberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so uh, that's important, I think, not only because this is, of course, the story that, uh, that Ruggie is taking up to explain what the nature of post-war liberalism is, and that it really is quite distinctive from this older form of liberalism. But it also shows up in, in a couple ways. One way it shows up is that uh, when he's arguing that everything is not falling apart in the late 70s, early 80s, because we're seeing the supposedly the rise of new forms of protectionism, uh, because we're seeing uh, frictions between the advanced industrialized democracies over trade, over monetary policy, because the dollar is depreciated, uh, and this is then mm -hmm. supposed to have thrown off a whole bunch of things. Um, he says that uh, essentially, uh, it looks like a, a collapse of liberalism if you hold it to this ideal of, of, of laissez-faire liberalism, but that's the wrong benchmark. Uh, and this is, I think, a, a kind of direct pickup from this argument in Polanyi about the utopian self-regulating market as an ideal, but not an actual, not actually what gets practiced. And, and how, if you benchmark everything against that, you always kind of screw things up. Um, mm -hmm. The second way, which is important, I'll just I'll just drop this here, is that uh, there is a real movement among uh, modern democratic socialists, or a real set of arguments among modern democratic socialists, and we will we'll get there pretty soon. Uh, that uh, it, the blame for what's happening now, right? The blame of, for the rise of Trumpism, uh, if you, you know, if you're a democratic socialist, you don't like Trumpism very much, right? Um, uh, the, the, the sort of our current troubles, our current travails are a result of an attempt to disembed liberalism uh, in the Washington consensus, which has produced social dislocation in a backlash. And this is why some uh, social, some democratic socialists will argue that we can't do more sort of centrist democratic stuff or center left stuff because that's just more neoliberalism. That will just make the problem worse. Uh, we need the actual, uh, we need the actual transformation. Uh, this is in some degree the argument that they're playing off of, right? The diagnosis of what happened in the war period they're saying is repeating because we made this mistake of third way centrism, which is just the return of disembedded liberalism and of a prioritization of markets. And this is of course, I mean, this is ultimately, I think, where both of us think that Ruggie gets some things wrong in his predictions, is that he sees the potential for the end of embedded liberalism, and he points to a couple of things, but he really thinks that embedded liberalism is clearly here to stay, which does not really anticipate what happens with the rise of the Washington Consensus, uh, the rise of, of third-way social democracy, and a really kind of pushback that's already happening in the 70s with the rise of Hayek, of sort of conservatives who are interested in Hayek, uh, Reaganism, Thatcherism, uh, away from embedded liberal, or towards this disembedded liberalism, towards marketization, towards what we can now call neoliberalism. Of course, you could make a claim that embedded liberalism still doesn't go away, even despite all of that. And uh, maybe if we have time, we'll get to that at the end of the book, because I think it has to do with his discussion. If you wanted to make that claim, it would have to do with the, his discussion of developing nations and the way that they play into the embedded liberal regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the kind of dissatisfaction that they have with it. But at the same time, there's a way that 
there's a way that they, he calls it a missed opportunity. So mm -hmm. they could benefit from it if they were integrated into the system in a different way. So I think we can, I think we can, we can certainly get to that. Um, well, since I look, I, we're jumping around and we decided yeah, we, we were going to definitely keep this thing short. So we'll just say it now. So Ruggie at the end of the book, I mean, the end of the article uh, or the end of the chapter, depending on where you're reading it, Ruggie says, you know, look, um, one of the, one of the dynamics that's going on here is that uh, embedded liberalism in the global, what we now call the global North uh, is made possible in part by sort of exporting the dysfunctions and the dilemmas of embedded liberalism onto the developing world. Right. Um, so he has this, um, uh, the compromise of embedded liberalism, this is on page 413, has never been fully extended to the developing countries. They have been disproportionately subject to the orthodox stabilization measures of the International Monetary Fund, often with no beneficial results in export earnings, but substantial increases in import bills and consequent increases in domestic prices. Moreover, the liberalization produced by the GATT has benefited relatively few among them. On the whole, the developing countries did well in the 60s as an adjunct to expansion in the OECD area. In the 1970s, they suffered as much from the export losses to OECD markets as they did from the direct impact of increased oil prices, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I don't know if you remember, you know, this is, I, I think, doesn't originate with him, but, but Naeem, uh, Naeem's comment that essentially, uh, which I, is not originate with him, I believe, but maybe it did, you know, which is essentially the compromise we have in the 80s and the 90s, ironically, is kind of socialism for the developed world mm -hmm. in the form of uh, social insurance programs, welfare state liberalism, even in the sort of neoliberal context, right. uh, and its austerity and laissez-faire capitalism for the developed world as a way of um, essentially making that system work. Right. So you end up with with social welfare at in the in the developed world and laissez-faire uh, sort of market marketization going on in the developing world precisely to uh, to pay for what's going on at the center. And the thing is that Ruggie, I think, unintentionally, or not unintentionally, it's not the right word, the word is maybe unknowingly, forecasts what's going to happen on 413, because he says that the greatest threat to embedded liberalism is, quote, the resurgent ethos of liberal capitalism which is then what we would call neoliberalism, the Washington consensus, the disembedding of the economies, and then the structural adjustment policies that had been forced by the IMF on various non-hegemonic and non-Western and non-white parts of the world would then be basically brought home um, in a strange echo of the way that lots of post-colonial scholars have pointed out that uh, techniques that were first tried in the colonies then come home to roost. So it seems like, oh, okay, those structural adjustment policies, we push them out into, into other areas, and now we're going to sort of do them ourselves and sort of remarketize everything. So in that sense, I think Ruggie is correct. The big threat here is this change in social purpose. And we can bracket the methodological question here for a second, because no matter how you identify social purposes, it is very clear that the market should have control over things and we should regulate it as little as possible is a different social purpose from the market should be strictly constrained by some set of broader social aims. So regardless methodologically of how we would choose to cast out social purpose, clearly there's a different social purpose embodied in the Washington consensus than there was in the synthetic thing that came out of Bretton Woods. Right, which is everybody, I mean, we should emphasize the modal uh, economy in the advanced industrialized democracies in Western right. Europe and the United States is a, w w was a mixed economy. And that's mm -hmm. how people talked about it, uh, you know, in terms of combining socialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, they just called the social democracy or Christian democracy, depending on whether it was a conservative or a, uh, a, a more liberal, a more yeah. socially liberal version. Or, or, or to use my favorite German term for it, the soziale Marktwirtschaft. So the social market economy. Right. which is always an uneasy compromise, but it's the idea that the market logic should be in some sense hemmed in by some set of social purposes, some set of Right, and that's purposes. why, I mean, as I said earlier, the kind of, the way that this comes to us in the United States, because it's hard for socialism to set root here for a variety of reasons that are probably worth exploring at great length, mm -hmm. is very much this kind of notion of saving liberalism from itself, right? We need to protect yeah. capitalism from the 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 excesses of the market. And right. this is the way that we think about New Deal liberalism. It's not anti-market. It's actually ultimately about saving the market. 
uh, by dealing with externalities, dealing with the, the way that it, it causes social, social dislocation, which undermines the conditions for its own maintenance. While I think in the, social, the more orthodox social democratic tradition, you know, markets are as good as they're instrumentally useful for promoting, mm-hmm. you know, promoting community gain. And we'll use the market if, it's, if it works, but we won't use the market if it doesn't. Right. Um, and in orthodox social democracy, more often than not, you don't use the market. Mm-hmm. Um, well, whereas, in, I, yeah, whereas I think in, in embedded liberalism, it, it is it really is about saving the market from itself by making sure, and this is where the international component of this becomes important, making sure that if there are costs to the market, they are not borne by the society that is sort of being subjected to market discipline. So instead of having to, con- to deflate your economy to deal with the balance of payments issue, you have something else that you can use so you can kind of keep employment there. But as Ruggie, I think quite rightly points out, those effects have to show up someplace. So where do they show up? Well, they get somewhat mediated by international currency notions, but then they end up getting externalized onto different parts of the developing world. So in that sense, the purpose of embedded liberalism, if it's to immunize a developed society from bearing the costs, bearing the economic costs of its own counter market policies, it's bought at the cost of somebody else buying all of those or absorbing all of those costs. The original Keynes version of this, that wouldn't happen because you would have a fully international currency, but you never had a fully international currency. You had the dollar as a reserve currency pegged to gold. Once those rates start floating, somebody's got to absorb the cost. And it turns out that the people who absorb the cost in a way that I think lots of hegemony theorists and lots of realists would be completely unsurprised by are the people who really can't resist. And the, those are the parts of the world that then get this sort of cost imposed on them through IMF conditionality and various kinds of structural reforms and so on and so forth. He's very clear about this. This is still a story about hegemony. Right? So there's this thread that runs throughout the entire argument that says there is a important power dimension here. It's, and it's a crucial power dimension, but it is power married to social purpose or sometimes power diverting from social purpose. And it is power married to social purpose that depends on a self-other distinction. We are the ones who have to be protected from the costs of these things. However, there's a they out there someplace, and they can bear those costs. And we can make them bear those costs, either because it's correct that they make these sorts of adjustments, or simply because they're not us and we're not going to feel the costs from those adjustments themselves. So the idea and I think this is an underplayed note in Ruggie's argument, embedded liberalism makes possible a certain form of, I don't quite want to say nationalism, but something like a, something like a state patriotism. So we can control ourselves and regulate our economy for our benefit because we don't have to make our domestic economy respond to the dictates of all these international market flows. So we can sort of protect our own people. We can pursue full employment policies in particular. But full employment policy is not for everybody. Full employment policy is for us. And other people can pursue full employment policies for them, but not for everybody. And because the system still has this externalization into it, right? Because it's still not a fully international currency. Somebody's got to bear the cost of it. So there's still some people who can't actually pursue these policies, but that's okay because that's them. So there's a weird nationalism or, or at least statism that kind of comes into this. I don't think it's, I don't think it's as um, hidden as you think it is. I mean, I think he's fairly clear that this accommodates national self-interest uh, in, a, in nationalism right, the national autonomy uh, in a way that maybe is not accommodated under orthodox liberal regimes, in Mm -hmm. which I think plenty of critics of the current order would say are not accommodated under the current neoliberal economic regime. So I think that's right. The other thing that I I did want to say is I think you are also correct that I sold Ruggie a bit short. Um, He very clearly does argue at the end, as you say, that the biggest threat to embedded liberalism is the rise of kind of a new movement to disembed liberalism. 
although what's interesting is that he says that, and I think actually that's not wrong, although it's a little rear view mirror by the early 80s to say this, right? That it's actually going to be inflation that helps, if I read him correctly, that it's actually going to be inflation that might be crucial to that pressure because in order for this system to work, you have to live with inflation. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. in, in that, of course, it is a critique of inflation in the 70s that launches, right. you know, it's Friedman and Thatcherism and that whole stew that we now think of as, as the, the rise of neoliberalism. Right. But there's also something really interesting there near the end of the piece. He, he switches very subtly his definition of embedded liberalism. Because embedded liberalism up through the, the period where he's talking about the post-war period and Bretton Woods and so on, embedded liberalism is a set of social purposes that are embodied in certain institutions. By the end of the piece, embedded liberalism is a set of normative dilemmas that as long as we recognize that there's a normative dilemma, say, on the balance between inflation and domestic protection, that there the regime is still continuing because now we at least recognize that as a normative dilemma. So there's a subtle change in, in what he thinks of as the part of the regime that, that continues. Because clearly the original social purposes, even if we accept his definition as those being the social purposes of Bretton Woods, those social purposes are tightly linked to a set of instruments. In order to get the idea that the instruments can change even though the social purpose is constant, he has to subtly redefine the social purpose. And I don't think the social purpose of Bretton Woods is to recognize a normative dilemma between these things. So to say that embedded liberalism is still there as long as we recognize that there's a normative dilemma involved in the relationship between, uh, between domestic protection and inflation, it seems to me that there's a much more expanded definition of what the embedded liberal order is by the end of the piece than there was at the, in the middle of the piece, certainly. Is Rogi on Mark Blythe's committee? Yes. Ah. <laughs> yes. If you don't know, uh, Mark's first book is, of course, Great Transformations, and it's about the 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 reversal of the Polonyite double movement. Right. It's about the it's about the disembedding of the economy, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, and indeed, his story is very sim is essentially the story that I've been invoking. Mm -hmm. Although to him, it really is just a contingency. It's just that. You get stagflation in the 70s. This is driven by really nothing that has anything inherently to do with mixed economies. And then you get Thatcher and Reagan coming to power and they introduce neoliberal policies and they introduce them at a time in which things get better. And so everybody says, aha, clearly, right, uh, it's, it's these policies that are, are, are more effective. And so we need to then further disembed liberalism. Uh, and actually, you know, in the United States case, it's Paul Volcker who saves us from the runaway inflation that has very little to do with, you know, Reagan's uh, fiscal policies, uh, I mm -hmm. think would be Mark's argument. Mm -hmm. So, you know, get the happy accident, but that for if you are a believer in neoliberalism and the disastrous uh, contingency, if you're a, a good old social Democrat. Uh, so what else do you think is kind of um, worth talking about here? Can I say one thing about that, about the happy accident thing? Yeah. Uh, because one of the, we talked about Polanyi earlier and about Ruggie's indebtedness to Polanyi for some of the conceptual architecture of this. One of the standard lines of critique against Polanyi is that Polanyi's understanding of the double movement of disembedding the economy and then re-embedding the economy is a fairly functionalist story. So automatically, as soon as you disembed the economy, then that provokes resistance and reaction and resistance and reaction results in the re-embedding of the economy in some way. Ruggie doesn't take that functionalist part. There's a way that for Ruggie, this isn't sort of a happy accident. Like they discovered at Bretton Woods that it's possible to do these things differently and they created something, something different like that. So instead of the idea that there would have to be some reaction against the fully disembedded market economy and it just happened to take this form, what you get instead is there was this move to fully disembed the economy. People recognized there were problems and it just happened to be the case that this is the one that was adopted by the hegemon. So there's a kind of accidental quality to Ruggie's argument when it comes to this. I think then where the accidents drop out is with the kind of path dependency. Bretton Woods exists, it's there. He tends to overestimate how much it's going to continue, that it's been locked in and that there's really not anything that's immediately going to take it apart except the sort of 
well, I think what he regards as an outside possibility of this disembedded movement of liberal capitalism. Right. Um, I mean, so it's important to emphasize a lot of the, there's the, what's going on theoretically, right? Yeah. But the argument of the moment is twofold. It's to say, you don't really have to worry about the decline of American hegemony because there is a widely shared con intersubjective consensus around what he calls embedded liberalism, uh, even if the ways of pursuing that change, right? So maybe you get a little bit more protectionism here, or a little bit more protectionism there. Uh, maybe you no longer have the gold standard, you don't have floating currencies. Uh, maybe you've gone to central bank independence, but whatever you're doing, the goal is the same, which is to produce a form of uh, liberal, a liberal regime that enables uh, unit level autonomy, right? En enables na national autonomy uh, in which allows the dual pursuit of full employment and low inflation, even if that dual pursuit is kind of doomed in his mm -hmm. view, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, you know, don't freak out thing, right? right. Which is the kind of, if, if you want to think about, if you want to use the terms of the 90s, this is the constructivist don't freak out versus the liberal institutionalist version that Cohen will publish in 1984. Um, the second element of this is to uh, argue that, um, is there a second element? I think there's a second element of at the moment, right? So it's don't freak out um, about US hegemony and right, and also don't freak out about there being a fundamental economic change. Right. right? So those are the two, yeah. I mean, those are the I, two. I sort of rolled them together in my explanation, but, mm -hmm. and, and these go together, right? If the social purpose can remain abs in, absent with a different power distribution, then of course you can have um, the regime, the economic regime persist. And that's part of the significance of his argument where he does decenter Britain in the story about the 19th century, where he sort of goes through in a sentence or two every major European great power and talks about how they're kind of converging on the same idea about the relationship between state and society for different reasons, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's one part. So that's that's sort of the, I think, the kind of two punchlines here. Um, and he gets them both kind of wrong, right? I mean, he gets the, you know, and I think, and I don't think wrong in a way that is sort of, a problem for, I mean, as you say, he, he identifies the right things, even if he doesn't think they're powerful enough. But the two parts of the story that we would look back and say, this is clearly not right, this got it wrong, would be first, the claim that um, liberalism is still embedded, as we've talked about. The second thing, right, is that, of course, U.S. hegemony didn't go away, right? It turned out that the United States used the post Bretton Woods period to reinscribe the dollar, right, as reserve currency, uh, you know, forced, you know, as I mentioned before, Carla Northoff is very good on this. You know, May, you know, Michael Mann has some some good stuff on this. It's you know, uh, Ike and Green, right? So this story, and I'm repeating myself, right? Uh, but you know, the story you've heard before, you'll hear from me again, right? U.S. hegemony persists; it becomes stronger. Japan, you know, Japan goes through its lost decade. The Soviet Union collapses, et cetera, et cetera. But really, the United States has encoded dollar primacy in a way that that is not obvious at all to a lot of people in this volume and is very obvious to Susan Strange. Right, right. The, and the petrodollars argument is the really important piece here because one yeah. of the things that reinscribes the United States isn't anything the US does, it's the US kind of permitting the trading of dollars in foreign markets, uh, so. See, but, but there are people in IPU who argues that the United States actually doesn't, this is saying the United States engineers. And I think that's actually correct is my understanding. For, um, for, for, for Ruggie, I don't think that's a deliberate engineering. Right. But nonetheless, it's petrodollars. It's also the, the use of uh, the dollar in, as the convertible, as in dollar convertibility is the basis of trade. Right? These mm -hmm. are the two things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you add on to that. And the question of how this is related is pretty central to what's going to happen in the next 15 to 20 years. But you add on to that the idea of the dollar as a safe reserve currency, which means that people will buy our, you know, people will purchase uh, treasuries you know, no matter how many we put out, which means that inflation remains low, which mm -hmm. means that we have the soft budget constraint that we can actually escape this at least temporarily uh, because we can do lots of massive spending and also, uh, you know, well, except we said, don't do it for that purpose because we, because we then have a, a neoliberal ideology which says we're not going to use our ability right. to run up deficits to engage in social insurance. We're gonna use it to cut taxes and to do military spending. And before that, we had used the fact that people would just buy U.S. Treasury securities, no matter how many we put out, to simultaneously fund the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson and also the war in Vietnam, which gets no mention here. So there is in, there's something interesting about focusing on economic hegemony without 
talking about military hegemony and military dominance that I think is sort of deliberate for the way that Ruggy is, is trying to, to construe this, but it's, it's really hard to separate the two of them because a lot of the problem, a lot of the Triffin window, the gold overhang stuff has to do with the fact that the U.S. is exporting the cost that what, what would have been inflationary cost of the great society by selling off treasury securities outside right, the once, United States. But once we do Vietnam, we actually, it's too much and we do produce spike inflation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the crash happens and that's why we mix and close of the gold window, right. so. And this is, again, this is like Thomas Oatley's really interesting argument that I'm sure I've alluded to before, which is that global boom and bust cycles are generated by United States military, essentially U.S. spending in wars that it deficit finances and thus sucks in far too much capital. Um, mm -hmm. And so we get that not just in the Vietnam era, but we also get that in the Iraq war when Bush refuses to raise taxes to finance the Iraq war. So this is interesting looking forward though, because, well, so if you just want to get a sense though of how, how, why I think it's hard to describe the current environment as embedded liberalism at all, you can read some of his discussion on page 401, 402, 403 about the characteristics of embedded liberalism and to some degree why they actually generate inter implicitly why they, they actually produce intersubjective consent, right? Mm -hmm. Intersubjective buy-in. So he talks, for example, he invokes Char you know, Charles Lipson uh, about how the trade adjustment that happens isn't pure Ricardo comparative advantage. It's actually, you know, sort of product specialization within firms. So you don't get massive disruptions. You don't get huge trade adjustment problems as people are laid off. Um, and in fact, this is what happens in the United States in the 90s, right? right? Um, right. Because we, for what, you know, we can debate about the reasons, but the trade deals we make do wind up actually closing entire industries uh, or at least closing large percentage of industries as that production goes overseas to places like China. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, there's an argument that it's tech productivity, but, you know, clearly there is something going on that's very different in the 90s. And John Ruggie himself has this presentation that he was carrying around in the late 90s, early 2000s about how uh, globalization looks really different now than it looked in the pre-war period or that it looked like in the post-war period, precisely because of distributed supply chains, distributed production, uh, and that this is a completely different game than the kind of political economy that he's describing uh, in the Embedded Liberalism article. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's very different now. Um, yes. And it's, it's really clear reading this, what is different about the Washington Consensus, what is different about the disembedding of liberalism uh, right. in the 80s and 90s. So in that sense, even though Ruggy, as a prophet, got a few things wrong, um, I think analytically, he still has a really good sense of what made that post-war order tick and the limits and the possible strains that that post-war order would be subjected to. So I think there's still quite a lot of value here. And it's useful that we're going to be reading Susan Strange next because that could be sort of part two of this discussion because she has, as we'll see, both critiques of the theoretical apparatus for thinking about regimes, but also critiques of the empirics. So we end up with kind of that same two-pronged thing that we've been talking about throughout this conversation, which we'll be able to pick up next time when we talk about Susan Strange. I think that's as good a time as any to end this. I think that's an excellent stopping point. Mm -hmm.